Well, when we closed our study on Matthew chapter 26 last time, we had been looking at the rather strange act of this common Jewish woman in Bethany that had just poured a great deal of costly perfumed ointment on Christ's head. Now, she probably didn't know why she did it, other than that she was overcome with some inner urge to do so. And Yeshua's disciples were none too happy about it because they viewed it as a silly and an extravagant waste of resources. Now, Bethany was a relatively small village that was an easy two-mile walk from Jerusalem. And during the festival periods, like Passover, it became sort of uh, a customary overflow area for Jewish pilgrims to find lodging as they arrived from all over the Roman Empire, including North Africa, even parts of Europe, to obey the Torah commandment to come to the temple for these God-ordained appointed times that they would sacrifice and celebrate. Now, on the surface, that is why Yeshua and his disciples were there. Under the surface, it was to fulfill the prophets that the Messiah would die an atoning death to save humanity from our just reward of eternal death. Now, so far in this chapter, we have seen that within Jewish society, there were two starkly different reactions to this holy man's presence in Jerusalem. The first was the opposition that is represented by the high priest and the, and the elders of the synagogue. The second was of welcome by many of the common Jews, although those residents of Jerusalem proper were a mixed bag of suspicion and adoration. And as we begin to enter this rather dark story of Yeshua's march to the cross, as Matthew frames it, despite the divine act and nature of Jesus, we must always keep in mind he was also fully human. He was human. He lived a real life. He suffered from thirst and from hunger, as we all do. He had emotions. They range from sad to apprehension to anger to frustration, all the way to wonder and awe and joy. And very soon, he was going to suffer from terrible pain. First, however, Jesus would suffer betrayal. It must also be kept in mind that Yeshua was not a victim of circumstances. In fact, it was he that was orchestrating the course of events. It was he who charted the exact path of his journey to the cross, using the wickedness of men as the vehicle to get there. Now, open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 26. Now, since we've already read this chapter all the way through, we're just going to reread it in short segments in order to get our footing. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're just going to read verses 14 through 16. Matthew 26, we're going to read verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> then one of the twelve, the one called Yuda from Creot, went to the head of Kohanim to the head priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I turn Yeshua over to you? Well, they counted out 30 silver coins and gave them to Judah, to Judas. And from then on, he looked for a good opportunity to betray him. Judas, the betrayer, makes his appearance. Now, the story of Judas has fascinated scholar and pastor and layman alike for centuries, why he did such treachery to his master that he knew so well is filled with mystery. 
I mean, exactly how long after Yeshua was, uh, was doused with perfumed ointment, this plot, Judah's hatch, hatch takes place, we don't know. No doubt, however, it was probably no more than a few hours. Judas was one of the 12 disciples, which is what makes his act all the more perplexing and treacherous. Might he have been present in Bethany to witness that woman pour her expensive perfume over his master's head? Could it have been this act somehow was the catalyst that drove him to take such a despicable action against Yeshua? I mean, the, the way Matthew places these two events in such immediate proximity in his gospel, it's my impression that this is exactly what we are meant to understand. The one was the cause for the other. Now, the Apostle John, in his own gospel account of Yeshua's life, reveals a little bit more about just who this man Judas was. He does this in John chapter 6, verse 71. There it says, He was speaking of Yehuda ben Shimon from Creote, for this man, one of the twelve, was soon to betray him. So this man's full name was Judas, son of Simon. Christianity more traditionally knows him as Judas Iscariot. Now the Iscariot part of this identification has always been somewhat of, a, of an enigma in trying to decipher just what it was designating. Some believe, as the complete Jewish Bible tenders, that it was the name of the town that he was from. And indeed, there may have been a town in ancient Judah named Kiriot. On the other hand, the English term Kiriot is probably taken from the Hebrew Kiriot, that simply means cities. It's kind of a generic term. So I can't buy into this concept that Iscariot is a Greek-English term that's the name of a town that Judas hails from. More likely it is that Iscariot is a translation of the Latin Sicarius. Most of our modern English translations of the New Testament have come from the Latin, which is what the Greek New Testament manuscripts were first translated to. And even when they have not come as direct translations from the Latin versions, certain loan words are taken from it and they appear in our Bibles. So, Sicarius means assassin. There was a known group in that day among the radical zealot sect of the Jews, the group that advocated for violent rebellion against Rome, called the Sicarii. This group was what we today might call terrorists. They were fanatics with no act of violence or criminality beneath them in attempts to achieve their purpose. They were most feared, interestingly, not by the Roman occupiers of the Holy Land, but rather by the Holy Land Jews, because the Sicarii would assassinate Jews that they thought had collaborated with the Roman enemy or those who refused to support them if they were asked. It's believed that the 1,000 men, women, and children who fled to the desert fortress of Masada and then committed mass suicide rather than be captured by the Roman Foreign Legion were members of the Sicarii. This term being transliterated into Greek easily becomes Iscariot and considering his radical actions, it pretty well fits Judas to a T. So, was Judas a zealot infiltrator that somehow burrowed his way into the inner group of Christ's 12 disciples? Perhaps. 
or just as likely, he truly thought that Yeshua of Nazareth may have been the Messiah in the typical Jewish sense of it, a charismatic military commander in the mold of King David that would lead the Jews into an overthrow of Rome, a recapture of the Holy Land, and then he'd sit on the throne as the first Jewish king of Judah to reign since Zedekiah, who ruled six centuries earlier. However, Yeshua's open prediction that within a few hours he would die by crucifixion and then display uh, his display of humility and allowing this woman to pour perfume on his head as a symbol of his burial procedure might have disillusioned Judas to the point of wanting Jesus done away with. See, the way Christ could draw the multitudes to himself, his triumphal entry, into Jerusalem in the mode of a king. His actions in the temple grounds where he took the cowardly uh, and deceitful religious authorities on, that uh, had, all this had Judas believing that Yeshua was the one that he and most of Judaism had yearned for for so long. Yet, Christ's most recent actions knocked him off that pedestal that Judas had built for him. Now Judas determined that he had mistakenly joined with the wrong man. So he waited for the right opportunity to approach the Jewish religious leadership to help them do what they so vigorously wanted to do, kill this threat to their lofty and lucrative positions. It's regularly offered in Christian circles that Judas betrayed Jesus simply for money, although 30 pieces of silver wasn't all that much money. Others comment that it was out of his zealot idealism. Both the Gospels of Luke and John characterize it as Judas operating in cooperation with Satan. However, the church sometimes this takes this view a little too far by spiritualizing it to the point that Judas just loses his human nature and nearly becomes the embodiment of Satan himself. The mention of the money can't be dismissed. While the silver may not have been the entire motive, it clearly played a significant role in his decision. His greed for money reveals that despite Judas's place among the twelve, he was no longer a true follower of Yeshua. So Judas seeks out the chief priest and he makes a bargain. Now this is not the high priest Caiaphas that is being spoken about. Rather, these are the most senior among the regular priests because the term chief priests is presented in the plural. He made the dirty deal with a small group of them. Now, Judas was paid. Then he went off to plot how best to turn Yeshua over to them. I'm going to insert here that if we pause to think about it, why did the chief priests need Judah at all to capture Jesus? They knew who Yeshua was. They knew he wasn't a violent man. I suspect the issue was they didn't know where he was. And because Jesus was a rather nondescript man in appearance, he wasn't all that easily identifiable in a crowd. I'll remind you yet again, this was Passover week. Jerusalem and its surrounding villages were positively overrun with crowds of Jews from everywhere. Yeshua was the classic needle in a haystack. And who better to know his whereabouts and his identity than one of his most trusted disciples? Well, after Matthew makes his insertion, probably for the sake of creating a kind of a timeline, 
he moves on to what came next. So now open your Bibles again. Back up to Matthew 26 and read along with me. We're going to read verses 17 through 30. 17 through 30. Matthew 26, starting at verse 17. On the first day for matzah, unleavened bread, the Talmudim, the disciples, came to Yeshua and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for your Seder? Go into the city to so-and-so, he replied, and tell him that the rabbi says, My time is near. My disciples and I are celebrating Passover at your house. The disciples did as Yeshua directed and prepared the Seder. And when evening came, Yeshua reclined with the twelve disciples, and as they were eating, he said, Yes, I tell you that one of you is going to betray me. They became terribly upset. They began asking him one after the other, Lord, you don't mean me, do you? And he answered, The one who dips his matzah in the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man will die, just as the Tanakh says he will. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him had he never been born. Judah, Judas, the one who was betraying him, then asked, Well, surely, Rabbi, you don't mean me. And he answered, The words are yours. And while they were eating, Yeshua took a piece of matzah, made the barachah, the, the blessing. He broke it, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Also, he took a cup of wine and made the baracha, the blessing, and he gave it to them, saying, All of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which ratifies the new covenant, my blood shed on behalf of many, so that they may have their sins forgiven. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing the Hallel, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, this is properly known as the Last Supper. And I'm going to frame this section by saying that the story begins in Bethany, it moves to Jerusalem, and then once again moves to outside the city walls across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. I'll also mention that the term Last Supper does not appear in the narrative. It's a name that later Christianity gave to it. Exactly what this ceremony was is actually controversial, if not enigmatic. I'll, I'll delve into this as we go. So this passage begins with words that seem rather straightforward. Verse 17, on the first day for matzah, the, the disciples came to Yeshua and asked, where do you want us to prepare your Seder? Now, different Bible versions choose very slightly different words, but there's no disagreement in the substance among them. This is speaking about the first day of the biblical feast of unleavened bread, matzah, which, according to the Torah, is a seven-day feast. However, when we know the Torah and we know Jewish tradition of the first century, this statement in verse 17 actually presents all sorts of conundrums. According to the Hebrew biblical calendar, I hope this illustration is some use for you. Take a good close look at it in the next couple. According to the Hebrew biblical calendar, something the entire Bible is based upon, the first day of the Feast of Matzah is Nisan 15. So, to read this passage literally, as it stands, means that the Feast of Passover, which occurs on Nisan 14, must have already ended. This, however, presents a major problem because it also speaks of preparing the Passover meal, the Seder, several hours prior to eating it. The problem is that the preparation for the Passover meal does not occur on the first day of matzah because the first day of matzah is a special Sabbath day. 
and no work can be done on it. This is why Passover Day, the 14th, was given the traditional nickname of Preparation Day. Now, we've already variously discussed in earlier lessons that just as in the modern Western world, we'll speak about our various holidays using different terms, usually not terms that are technically precise. Still, everyone knows by context and custom what it is we're talking about. I gave the example of the last half of December being called things like the holiday season. The Christmas holidays are just the holidays. You're speaking of Christmas as including not just Christmas Day, but also Christmas Eve and even extending something we call Christmas Week to include New Year. We use all these terms. None of this troubles or confuses because we're familiar with how all this terminology is meant. See, it worked that way for the feasts of Passover and unleavened bread in Yeshua's era. Thus, there's no way that the scrupulously Torah-observant Christ would have instructed His disciples to do the work of feast preparation on a Sabbath, something that is expressly forbidden in the Torah, and it's a grave sin. Okay, we must have some calendar issues at work here. Let's begin unpacking this puzzle by destroying a misconception among many Jews and most Christians who know little, if anything, about these biblical feasts. It is regularly said that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is an eight-day event, and yet the Torah clearly says it's a seven-day event. Why this difference? It's because of what happens when we overlay a Hebrew calendar upon a Roman calendar. Because the Hebrew and Roman calendars each assume different starting and stopping points to define a day, a 24-hour period, and the names and lengths of Roman months differ from the Hebrew months, then to say something like, the Feast of Unleavened begins on the 15th of Nisan and ends on the 21st, it gets confusing. When we overlay those two calendars, we see that in relation to a Roman calendar, that's our modern day calendar, each Hebrew day stretches across portions of two Roman calendar days. So it can appear on a modern Roman calendar that the Feast of Matzah lasts eight days and not seven. Further, the date of the Hebrew month, such as the 15th of, of Nisan, only rarely coincides with the same date, in our example, the 15th, within a Roman calendar month. Of course, this was not an issue biblically, nor is it confused in the Bible, because the Jews never entertained the use of the Roman calendar, and the Bible only uses the Hebrew calendar. Now, the underlying nature of this issue begins in that when taken together, the consecutive feasts of Passover and then unleavened bread together last for a total of eight days. Due to the logistics and many practicalities of later Hebrew society, the two feasts eventually became conjoined in Jewish eyes, even though technically everyone knew they were two separate feasts. The result was that it was common among Jews to call the entire eight-day feast period Passover, or just as common to call the same period, all of it, 
unleavened bread. That's not too tough to grasp. Unfortunately, it gets a little more complex. And the reason for this added complexity is that the Galileans seem to have created some of their own traditions for this holiday period that differed somewhat from what the Jews who lived in Judea, how they celebrated it. Now, partly this was because the Jews of Judea all lived in close proximity to the city of Jerusalem, while all the other Jews, including those from the Galilee, had to pack up and travel two or three days, even a week or more, to get to the temple in Jerusalem. So the realities of distance and travel time played a major role in how Jewish festival traditions evolved. After all, when the Torah laws concerning the required observance of these feasts were first created and given to Moses, it was 1,300 years earlier at the time that the wilderness tabernacle was the place of worship for the Israelites. They hadn't completed their journey to the promised land yet, let alone had they conquered it. During those 40 years in the wilderness, all the Israelites lived encamped tribe by tribe in rings around the tabernacle so no one had to make a journey to get to it. But a long time later, when Joshua captured Canaan and Israel was divided into 12 tribal regions, greatly spread out over the entire land, distance now became a barrier that had to be overcome. Jerusalem was where the temple would eventually be built. And thus nearly all Israelites had to leave their homes and make a substantial journey to get there to celebrate the feasts. Except, of course, for those Israelites that lived in Judah, the tribal territory where Jerusalem was located. Well, after Rome conquered the Holy Land, and after the Israelite tribalism, and along with it, tribal boundaries had long been extinguished, the Roman governing districts of Judea and Galilee were established in the former Holy Land and a couple of other regions as well. And in time, the Jewish residents of those districts became less than harmonious. Hatred of the residents of one district for another is probably too strong, but each went out of their way to establish their own customs and traditions that, that better suited their circumstances. And it seems that nearly certainly this is what was at play when we're trying to unravel this strange event called the Last Supper. It is really with the growing influence of modern day Jewish believers and their academics that these matters that involve the seven biblical feasts are being re-examined. And in some cases, it is leading to a few of the stories in the New Testament having to be redefined. See, here's the deal. There is no way that the Last Supper was the biblical Passover Seder. It could not have been. Passover would have to have ended for it to occur, and Jesus is known to have been crucified on Passover day. If he was not crucified on Passover day, but rather the next day, it would have been on the first day of matzah, which is the Sabbath. This makes no sense. Because later on, we're going to read that there was this huge urgency to get his body down from the cross. Why? So that they could get him interred before a Sabbath began. 
Dr. Baruch Corman and Rabbi Joseph Shulam are among those who have offered possible solutions to the problem, and despite some technical differences, they do agree that while the Last Supper happened on Passover, it was in the first hours of Passover, which is at nighttime, somewhere between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Remember, oh, this is hard for us. A Hebrew day begins at sunset. So in the first hours of Passover, Nisan 14, meaning nighttime, there was a gathering of Yeshua and his 12 for some kind of a ceremonial meal. The following afternoon, which in the Hebrew calendar is still the same day, remember, Days begin at sunset, he'd be killed. Now, whatever Last Supper was, clearly it was customary for Jesus and for those who made up his 12 disciples to celebrate it. Also remember, Jesus and his 12 disciples were all Galileans. So they had their own traditions apart from those typically celebrated in and around Jerusalem of Judea. Now, rather than further try to characterize the meal that night, let's move on to what happened during it. I want to begin by reading Mark's version of it, the Gospel of Mark, Mark's version of it. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark, chapter 14. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. And we're going to read verses 12 through 26. Mark 14, starting at verse 12. Mark 14, 12 to 26. On the first day for matzah, when they slaughtered the lamb for Passover, Yeshua's disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare your Seder? And he sent two of his disciples with these instructions, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And whichever house he enters, tell the owner that the rabbi says, Where is the guest room for me? Where I am to eat the Passover meal, and my Talmudim. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations there. The Talmudim, the disciples, went off. They came to the city. They found things just as he told them they would be, and they prepared the Seder. When evening came, Yeshua arrived with the twelve. And as they were reclining and eating, Yeshua said, yes, I tell you that one of you is going to betray me. And they became upset. They began asking him one after the other, you don't mean me, do you? It's one of the twelve, he said to them, someone dipping matzah in the dish with me. For the Son of Man will die, just as the Tanakh says he will, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him had he never been born. While they were eating, Yeshua took a piece of matzah, made the barakah, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And he also took a cup of wine, made barakah, and said it to them, and they all drank. And he said to them, This is my blood which ratifies the new covenant, my blood shed on behalf of many people. Yes, I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day I drink new wine in the kingdom of God. After singing the Hallel, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Yeshua said to them, You will all lose faith in me, for the Tanakh says, I will strike the shepherd dead, and the sheep will be scattered. Okay. Notice how Mark has time-stamped the Last Supper. He, like Matthew, says it was the first day of the Feast of Matzah, Feast of Unleavened Bread. But then, unlike Matthew, <laughs> he adds, it was the day when the lambs were slaughtered. Oh, this gets confusing. 
See, from a technical standpoint, this just doesn't work. The lambs are not slaughtered on the first day of unleavened bread. They're slaughtered the day before that, on Passover day. This is why we must not try to apply the technical Torah sense to these words we're reading, but rather to understand it from the casual conversation way of the era in which these biblical holidays, these biblical festival days were spoken about. For the common Jewish person, Passover and unleavened bread had just become synonyms. So the first day of unleavened bread for them meant the first day of the eight-day feast period that conjoins one day of Passover with seven days of unleavened bread to form one big event. Let me also add that eating unleavened bread was not a biblical requirement for Passover day. Therefore, it would not have been a requirement for the Last Supper, even though by a created Galilean tradition, they may have started eating only unleavened bread a couple of days earlier than was required by the Torah, but that's my speculation. And there's no real written evidence for it. This would not have been a sin. I mean, we could choose to eat unleavened bread every day of the year, and this is perfectly in tune with the Torah commandments. Well, of a few differences between Mark's and Matthew's versions of the Last Supper, perhaps the one we need to notice most is that in Matthew verse 28, it says Jesus' blood, as symbolized by the wine, is for the forgiveness of sins. Mark makes no mention of this. Matthew seems to have a better understanding of the atoning power of Christ's sacrifice, and it is something he emphasizes, and so he's built it, built up to it, and he's put it in his gospel. Now, beyond these differences is a point that I'll make up front so that you can watch for it. The words chosen by Christ and the way things proceed during the Last Supper has a direct link to the words spoken by Moses at Mount Sinai as he makes covenant with God. See, I bring this up because a few times during our extensive study of Matthew, I've urged you not to miss this underlying characterization of Yeshua as the second Redeemer the second Moses, which he surely is only greater even than Moses. Now the scene begins with the disciples asking Jesus where he wants them to prepare the Seder. Now, while we find those words in the complete Jewish Bible, in fact, the question that is asked is where to prepare the Passover. So the underlying complete Jewish Bible assumption is that this is referring to the Torah commanded Passover meal, which I claim it is not. It cannot be. I'll say this again, I'm probably again later, <laughs> because it's so hard to wrap our minds around it. Indeed, the Last Supper was a Passover meal, but only in the sense that it occurred on this on the 14th, Passover. However, this is not the same as the biblical Passover meal as described in the Torah, the one that the Jews call the Passover Seder. And I know this for two reasons. First, the Passover lambs had yet to have been slaughtered. You can't have a Passover Seder without the Passover lamb. And second, because the actual biblical Passover Seder doesn't even occur on Passover, despite its name. It happens in the few, first few hours of the next day, which begins just after dark, just after sunset, 
which is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is exactly the way it happened in the Exodus from Egypt. The Passover Seder is indeed prepared on Passover, but it's not eaten until the sun sets. So the day changes. Then it's on 15th, the beginning of the Feast of Matzah. Therefore, because Christ is talking to his fellow Galileans, and they're all thinking in terms of Galilean traditions, and because the conversation is merely using standard terms of the times, then Yeshua's reference to the Passover merely means the meal that the Galileans eat shortly after dark, the first couple of hours after the day turns to Nisan 14, Passover. This is the Last Supper. And one of the assumptions often made in sermons about this event is that we ought to notice that Jesus did not eat the Passover with his biological family. Rather, he chose to do this with his disciples. And that we are to understand from this that this is due to his replacement of his Jewish family with his new spiritual family. And while this is an interesting thought, and one that Gentile Christians prefer to hear, we can outright dismiss it. Because even though it was biblical tradition to eat the Passover meal with family, I've already demonstrated the Last Supper was not the Passover meal. So Yeshua instructs the disciples now to go from Bethany into the city of Jerusalem and find a certain unnamed man. And he's there to tell them that Rabbi says that his time is at hand. That is, his time to be arrested and killed. That also they're going to celebrate Passover at his house. Now, it can only be that this had to be something that was prearranged. And whoever this man was, the disciples knew of him. Mark puts it a little bit differently. He says in Mark 14, 13 to 14, <clears throat> he sent two of his disciples with these instructions. Go into the city, Jerusalem, tell a man carrying a jar of, uh, and, and, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And whichever house he enters, tell him that the rabbi says, where is the guest room for me and where am I to eat the Passover meal with my disciples? So the disciples are to find this man carrying a jar of water who is waiting for them. The disciples are to follow this man to the house he has reserved for the purpose of this Last Supper meal. And they are to say that their rabbi, the better translation for us is probably their master, wants to know where the guest room for him is and also where is the room where they're to eat the Passover. That is, one place for Jesus to sleep, the other for Jesus to have this meal with his 12. What's happening here was common in Jerusalem during those busy feast days. Thousands of pilgrims needed places to stay. And so the local residents would open their homes and rent out rooms not so much as a moneymaker, but as a righteous deed of hospitality. The place was known to be on the second floor of a building. Two and three story buildings being common in the densely populated Jerusalem of that time. Now I want to pause here <laughs> to address the matter of the upper room that one can visit on tour today in Jerusalem. I can confidently say this is not where the Last Supper took place. It's located in the modern Greek section of Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And the tourist is taken to this very large room where you could easily put 100 people in it. But this room was actually built during the Crusader era. Sorry to pop any bubbles. <clears throat> in any case, the disciples left Bethany went into the city, found the man, 
and the room prepared for them just as Yeshua said they would. Then the disciples made the meal preparations when evening came, meaning when the day changed. They ate while reclining, a usual Jewish custom for a festival meal. Essentially, the Last Supper became a farewell meal. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the relationship of the Last Supper to the Mount Sinai covenant ceremony with Moses. So I'm going to just take just a moment to read you a short section from Exodus. From Exodus 24, I'm just going to read verses 3 through 7 so you can see this coming together. Moses came and told the people everything Adonai had said, including all the rulings. And the people answered with one voice, we will obey every word Adonai has spoken. Moshe wrote down all the words of Adonai, and he rose early in the morning, built an altar at the base of the mountain, set upright 12 large stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent the young men of the people of Israel to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen to Adonai. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. The other half of the blood he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it aloud so that people could hear. And they responded, everything that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. Now there's a few more connections, but for the moment, I just want you to notice the number 12. At the Last Supper, Yeshua involves 12 disciples. At the Mount Sinai covenant ceremony, the 12 tribes of Israel are represented by 12 large stones set upright. We'll soon get to the use of blood in the ceremony. I have no doubt that Yeshua choosing 12 men to be his disciples is meant to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're told in other places in the New Testament that these 12 will sit in judgment of the 12 tribes. A one-to-one -one relationship. Well, next we read that during the eating of the meal, Yeshua drops a bomb on the proceedings. One of those seated at the table is going to betray him. No details of it, no details when, are put forward. I mean, I, I think it's hard to overstate how agitated this would have made all of them. They believe him even to the point that each of them seeks to be exonerated. The concern for them is less that Yeshua is going to be betrayed and suffer the consequences than it is that one of them will do the deed. And since the beginning of the collecting of the Twelve, you know, they've always been concerned about themselves. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to gain the most? We've, we've read of these arguments, these debates. We can sort of stand back and shake our heads and disgust them for thinking like that, but they were just being no more nor less than human. In some ways, we are to be comforted in this knowledge that if those great men who were taught directly by the Messiah could battle over self versus service, then we shouldn't beat ourselves up too badly when we inevitably do the same. This is not an excuse or we to feel enabled to be self-oriented. Rather, it is that while our goal as followers of Messiah is to be perfect in devotion, to Yeshua and to the Torah principles, yet the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's a process. It's a process that takes effort. And despite our best intentions, we are going to fail from time to time. The 12 disciples are perhaps one of the best biblical examples of this kind of failure inherent to our fallen nature. But also it's a revelation of how all but one 
would soon right themselves and rise above their failures. Well, during the turmoil, when each disciple nervously asked if the Lord was referring to them, he replied with the equally cryptic, the one who dips his matzah in the dish with me is the one who's going to betray me. Now, although the complete Jewish Bible takes some, I think, unneeded liberties with this verse, when it says the one who dips his matzah, there is no reference to bread or matzah in this passage. It's not there. Rather, it says the one who dips his hand in the dish, in the bowl. The matzah reference continues to incorrectly assume that this meal is the official biblical Passover Seder. That's why it's inserted. This comment from Yeshua no doubt didn't at all soothe the disciples' anxieties because there is no particular disciple that has put his hand into the bowl. All have. One by one, they seem to question Yeshua if it's them. Now, clearly, this matter of Yeshua knowing something that only a person with divine foreknowledge could, and that's the context of what they're questioning is asking. That is, their questioning is, is more, will it be me, rather than it's not me. You see what I'm saying? They really were wondering, is it going to be me? Yeshua scares them all a little bit further by invoking his favorite title for himself, the Son of Man. And he says, it's written that he'll be betrayed and die. It is written means two different things to a Jew. One, it meant a written biblical prophecy. And two, it meant something like, we would say today, well, it's written in stone. That is, it's predestined. It can't be changed. It's a done deal. There is no specific scripture that says such a thing. So the point is that neither the coming betrayal nor its consequences are going to be a surprise. Evil can't overtake Yeshua without him knowing about it in advance. And by implicating choosing to allow it to happen. This is a classic case of God using what is intended as evil for good. Even though this is the case, Christ says, oh, woe to the person who will betray the Son of Man. The consequences will be so severe for him that he will wish he hadn't been born to suffer them. No doubt this expresses the eternal punishment that will result. Finally, Judas speaks up and feigning innocence asks if it could be him. I mean, what else could he do? Wouldn't it be terribly suspicious if he were the only one who didn't inquire? Yeshua nails him. He says, well, words are yours. This is a Jewish expression. It means you've just condemned yourself. Now, strangely enough, this topic just seems to get shelved for the time being. Because with Yeshua identifying Judas in the front of the ele other 11, it just moves on. And just as strangely in Mark's gospel, it's left out that Yeshua exposed Judas as the betrayer. Well, either way, the reader already knows who it is. What comes next is what was eventually transformed into the church sacrament of communion. Now, there's much to discuss about it, but our time is over for today. So we'll pick up with that next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose, HolyLandMarketplace.com
For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.